Hi, I'm Kim Wilson. And I'm Natasha Marchevka. And this is Speechless. Speechless. Welcome to our behind-the-scenes take on Real Life in VIA, where we share our stories, our resources, and our unsolicited opinions. And um, today we have another fabulous guest. His name is George Washington III. Natasha, he's your very good friend. I he think is. you need to introduce him properly. He is. Well, we did a good job of asking him um, to give us some of his background because it's so varied and interesting. But we asked George questions about what it's like to be an African-American male in voiceover. Kim and I really wanted to know his perspective on things. And he's one of the smartest people I know, one of the nicest people I know, and actually one of the most talented people I know. (laughs) So have a listen. Okay, everyone, so happy to have George Washington III with us here today before we get started with all our questions and George's um, background in terms of all the things he brings to our table today, we're going to have a cheers. So George, what did you bring today to share to cheers with? Well, uh, today, as I may have mentioned, I'm not much of a drinker, but on occasion I can, <laughs> I can uh, get myself to drink cider. So I have a ah, red, yes. apple, yes. red apple yes. cider here and to yes. go with today's. P.S. Okay. Listen to that voice. Yeah. <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous. gorgeous. I'm not much of a drinker either, but every time, you know, and I, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I have a little sparkling wine. It's Fink's Blanc de Blanc. It sounds lovely. fancy, but I think it's from Lodi, California. So that's lovely. <laughs> what I am drink? drinking. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Ooh, look at I that. Know. <laughs> I know. This is called a blood moon and it has yeah. a bunch of different stuff in it. But the top is Empress Gin, which of course is my party trick. And the bottom is Aperol and blood uh, orange and a little more. Aperol. 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 Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Gorgeous drink. Cheers. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, George. Mm-hmm. And I only thank took a sip of the purple. Oh, it's not, not mixed. Yeah, not mixed. <laughs> that was very but it was a good drink. party trick. <laughs> <laughs> so we have important kind of heavy questions to ask George today but George um I want everyone to know that he's actually organizing Wovocon 7 which um is in Orlando May 5th to 7th 2023 so if you're watching this after unfortunately you've missed the boat but um <laughs> him and I are on the board of uh, executive board of directors for you guys are working um, your butts off world voices mm. <sighs> Pulling it together. George, give us a little sampling of your, let's say, bio, your voiceover journey. But I'll, I know you do so many things. Share yeah. a little bit for our audience, please. please. Okay. Well, um, the very beginning, I started as a, I was a voice major. I sang at uh, Northwestern University and then wow. promptly stopped performing. I went oh. into IT and I started working. At, I worked for Discover Card and then I worked for one of the banks here in the wow. Southeast. Um, and when I got here, I was asked to be a host, uh, for on-camera videos for the company. And, um, so I said, Where's here, when you said I I'm, got I'm here. in Charlotte, North Carolina. Perfect. And, um, the funny thing about that was I met the person who asked me was named Elizabeth Taylor. So Elizabeth Taylor and George <laughs> of Washington it was. <laughs> were in an elevator and Elizabeth Taylor asked George Washington to be on television. So there you go. <laughs> Like what? So, yeah, exactly. And so okay. I started hosting their videos. So I I would go in, I would be shooting where we shot on campus and things like that. And sometimes we'd go offsite. And then once they said, well, we need you to go to a studio to record this voiceover for it. And I went to this local studio and I went, ooh, that's... Um, that seems like fun. (laughs) And uh, I actually asked them, what do I need to do so I can do this? And they said, well, you know, go get some scripts, bring them back and uh, we'll make your demos. So they cost those, those demos cost me a grand total of $300. So think back, you know, what that was, (laughs) you know, 1984. Like when was this? Uh, That was 2002. (laughs) Okay. 
So um, that's when I started doing voiceover of any sort. And, uh, you know, since then I've been doing pretty much everything but um, audiobooks, although I've done a few, I don't do audiobooks anymore. Um, so I have just continued to kind of grow and do more and more things when they come available, because I am really a jack of all trades. I'm like, are you going to pay me to say it? Then probably I will do it. But, um, <laughs> okay. I, I also, like that. that's you know, going to be a good motto. Hey, works for me. You know, and I've done some real, real news television. I was, a uh, a, a traffic host part-time. So I was telling people how to get around the area. Uh, when my guy would call me and say, George, I'm going to take vacation. You want to come in Thursday and Friday? So there I was at 4.30 in the morning doing mm -hmm. <laughs> traffic on television. So wow. none of that anymore. But that was that was an interesting time. Okay. Wow. What a story. <laughs> <laughs> and he's also still an opera singer. Yeah. So no way. Squeezing in those gigs. Uh huh. Oh yeah, my gosh. Matter. So I sang with Opera Carolina here in Charlotte for 12 years in the chorus and in small roles and things like that. And then I stopped for 10 years. And then last year I came back and we did Martin Luther King opera called I Dream. And it's very mm -hmm. new and contemporary. And we just wrapped up Porgy and Bess here in Charlotte. Um, and we'll be doing it again in April in Raleigh, North Carolina. So oh, I'll have two more performances. So yeah, this is, as Natasha knows, we're, we're doing all this planning. It is like, oh, and I'll be out of the office for a week, but you know, but I will still be available for stuff and making decisions. But yeah, it's uh, opera has been an interesting challenge. Um, it's important for me as it helps me breathe. I mean, let's be honest, to sing that way. Yeah, I have to yeah. sing, I have to, and, and it lets me get out and do something different. Yeah. And uh, it gives me something to talk about because not everybody who does this is uh, is this kind of singer. So, no. Yeah. Hi there. I'm Danny States. I'm the founder of Voice Overview. And I just want to invite you to give us a try. We offer a 30 day free trial. We are the business tracking and management system designed by voice actors for voice actors. It's a great platform for you to manage and control your voiceover business. Voice talent need quiet. For us, quiet comes in the form of a Studio Bricks booth. Now we've recorded in closets and nothing against closets, but with families and the need to raise our game, we both independently bought a Studio Bricks. I love my booth because when clients see it on Zoom, they know I'm the real deal. But also, I feel more professional in it. And I like Studio Bricks because it's whisper quiet in my noisy neighborhood and also is gorgeous. Right? <laughs> I have a Studio Bricks one. And I have the voiceover edition. I want that. <laughs> Head over to StudioBricks.com. World-class sound isolation booths, high-quality materials, less environmental burden. Um, um, so you started in 2002 in voiceover. So we're talking about the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And as we can all tell by the news, in you know, racism in the 21st century is still pervasive. Mm -hmm. And so we're, Kim and I are really interested in knowing your perspective on how how voiceover um, is to you as a person of color um, and a black man. And maybe there's no surprises to us. Maybe there's a ton of surprises to mm. us. We really, we have no idea. Mm. Can you tell us your experience of being uh, in the voiceover industry as a person of color? Maybe well, from the beginning or from today or both? Sure. What is that about? What is that like? Well, um, I will tell you, this is one of my favorite stories. My very first job in voiceover was a commercial for the Augusta Chronicle, a no longer extant newspaper in Augusta, Georgia. And I went into this session with some experienced voice talent all in the same room. I mean, like, when does that happen anymore? Mm -hmm. We were all in the same room doing the script simultaneously. The person directing was in another location. So we all read our lines. And we got done and the gentleman directing said, that was great, everybody. Um, George, um, could, um, would, could you sound more black? Um, and uh, mm -hmm. I said, uh, said. <laughs> yeah, what is, is, uh, is this more like it? This is what you want me to hear? You want to hear something more like this? 
He said, yeah, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I, I, I got it. Yeah. So there you go. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. most, a lot of people don't know this. That's called code switching, right? That's a thing that many people of color and a lot of people who just do telephone work, right? People who are, who work on the telephone do, they mm -hmm. call it your off your phone voice or your office voice, uh -huh. but black people in the United States who want to do things that aren't in black culture and have to in, in corporate America and things like that will code switch people who are okay. any people of color will code switch in order mm -hmm. to speak in a way that is acceptable in the workplace and speak differently when they're at home. Mm. Now that is just a skill, right? That is something <laughs> that um, when I coach um, African-American voice a actors when they're first getting George started. is a coach too, by the way, we didn't mention that part. And I, I said here, this is a power that you have. It's a mm. thing that mm. you need to be able to do because mm -hmm. this is, you hear how I'm speaking right now. It is obvious that I didn't, <laughs> that there's a way that I, I sound, um, 12 years of Catholic school, <laughs> a father who is like, you'll speak to be understood. So this mm. is what I sound like. But mm. if someone needs to ha wants that, what we will call a stereotypical black voice, it's possibly there because I know how to code switch. Mm. Now, yeah. this thing about uh, how we are presented, you've mentioned about how people of color are treated in, in voiceover. And I will say that things have changed. Things have gotten a lot better. They've mm -hmm. improved a lot, particularly around the time of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. When the pandemic improved started, during yes. the pandemic. Okay. Yes, right? absolutely. One of the things that seemed to happen is people mm -hmm. started mm -hmm. to say, you know, we need to be looking more at diverse, not just diverse talent, but making sure that we're reaching out to markets that are that are representative of other people and with voices that they trust. Mm -hmm. And that has um, been of a benefit, not only to voice actors of color, but to women as well. Mm -hmm. And it has been interesting to watch as women have gotten into spaces that traditionally were not allowed sports, right? Automotive, mm -hmm. things that we didn't normally see promo, things that we saw very few women in now, because of the span of what they're trying to do and who they're trying to reach the availability for the work has grown. Mm -hmm. Now, this does not mean that um, there is probably not some kind of discrimination still lurking around in various corners. It is very rare to encounter anything like that, at least in my experience, for someone to be out and out discriminatory about how you are being engaged. Mm -hmm. We only know, you know, what we get cast for. Okay. and how mm -hmm. so we can't really say this is happening unless we can see the other side i do know that more castings and more opportunities that specifically ask for people of color um people who speak other languages people who come from different backgrounds that that has grown over the years mm -hmm. and is good. it enough okay is it enough it's a good question i don't know if there's ever a thing where you say, okay, that's great. That's perfect. You're doing right. 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 Um, right. You think about how we exist in what we do, right? It's only enough when you're getting enough. Yeah. And there's only so much we have in control of that. The thing that has to happen for more of these things to happen mm -hmm. is there need to be people of color and women in decision-making positions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that has to happen. And yeah. as you've noticed in the world today, there are plenty of people who will dispute that, who will say that, you know, we can't talk about those things because people will be made to feel bad. I don't want you to feel bad. What mm -hmm. I want you to do is consider somebody <laughs> else's position. Sure. Yeah. Consider mm -hmm. somebody else's experience. Yeah learn how to walk in somebody else's shoes for a little bit. And that has been the, uh, in our industry, because you know, our interest industry tends to be very giving on an individual and, you know, and in a group level up to a certain level, of course, you know, people don't just give once they get to a certain level of success, 
but <laughs> you know there's we are in general a very giving and open and accepting artists maybe yeah, that's why artists, artists, that's sort of part of it artists, we're yeah. different though at, than people who are acting on stage and a little different than mm -hmm. people who are acting in television okay um and that's you know it's not to say that they are worse or better we're different right okay yeah so okay so i um use the platform voice one two three a fair bit and teach people how to use it and there's a thing about keywords and searching for voices and um i was i'm thinking that the online casting and casting in general needs to get better at asking for what they want so a lot of times they don't know what they want but it's always bothered me that they um like the terminology is so thin and not that great in terms of what they want for diversity so urban is a word that is used well, you can have is used to seek out african-american people and that to me doesn't match up so you can have some white people that have this urban accent but just because your skin is black doesn't mean you're going to have a certain accent do you have any ideas about what terms we can use to find what we want i mean deep you have a deep voice Mm -hmm. And you can tell sometimes the color of people's skin, but just because your skin is a certain color doesn't mean you're going to sound a certain way. It's very difficult to talk about, I, but I think it's so important um, just from a casting perspective to, to cast appropriately and well, but also be uh, politically correct and informed. So what are your thoughts on those words and terminologies that we can use? Um to be honest, um, because urban is a euphemism, you know, it is like, oh, if I say urban, you know what I mean, wink, wink, uh, right? Uh. Just say you need a black voice, right? <laughs> and, and that is... Um, a black voice that has right. a Chicago accent, that has a so, Southern accent, that has this or that? So there's a thing, right? If we say, uh, I've seen people's, I've seen castings that look for someone with a black Southern accent. If someone needs a New Orleans accent, a black New Orleans accent and things like that. Mm -hmm. They have a choice if they have a decision that's that fine grained, because mm -hmm. you're not going to be like, if you're looking for someone to do stuff for say, I'm going to use a brand name, Zatarans for, yeah. for the right. <laughs> of course, you're going to be looking for a New Orleans Orleans. accent, you know, mm -hmm. that wouldn't take Dr. John out of, you know, somebody like that out of contention because he's white, but you're going to, you would still, that's going to be the assumption unfortunately part of the business is generalization because mm -hmm. you know when you ask somebody if you were to ask somebody what does a black voice sound like mm -hmm. what makes a voice black it seems um ephemeral there isn't something where you say that person is specifically black but many times if you hear somebody's voice you know they are mm -hmm. um can't always trust it can't always know i had mm -mm. no idea the gentleman who does uh the uh who does interstitial stuff for npr is i think japanese mm -hmm. but if you hear him you're like hmm, that sounds like a black man oh, but you know, that's okay. right but oh. it's not so it's it's possible to under well what i what i mean to say is it is likely that some of this is never really going to go away okay. because they need to generalize. It is, okay. you know, unless you really are doing something that says, I need someone with a Chicago accent, mm -hmm. who live, you know, someone who lives in, you know, in the city of Chicago, it sounds like that. If you ask that for, for somebody, you will hear the, the Bears thing, right? Because that's Chicago. The that's Bears, what Chicago right. sounds like. Um most people can't make any other differentiation southern right southern accents they are different in north carolina than they are in georgia and sure. south carolina and eastern north carolina versus western north carolina sure. so most people can't yeah. make those kind of distinctions right. so in order to get anything done they will often shorten it up and when it comes to race and ethnicity that can be you know a problem for some people i think about our friends, um, Rosie and Brian Amador. Mm -hmm. mm. 
on their website yes that the accentometer which yes. is one of the coolest things i've ever seen totally <laughs> like, totally completely un unaccented english or fully in spanish and four degrees in between those two it's incredible um because people need accented accented english and there's certain levels that they want to give mm -hmm. that makes it easy for that purpose for them mm -hmm. That's not going to be an acceptable choice for me, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, how do right. I ask somebody, you know, it seems ridiculous to have a question. Well, how black do you want me to be? Yeah. Right. Mm. I'm black. It doesn't matter what you say or how I sound. That's what I am. Right. But if you listen to my demos, you will hear a difference in different spots based on what kind of thing we're talking about, what kind of thing we're advertising. Mm. So it's, um, there is, I don't know that there's a way to do it without somebody finding a way to be offended about it. Mm. Uh. I think there's a, because as, as black voice actors, we have to get in there and say, here's what we present and here's what our true selves are, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to for everything, for everyone. Mm -hmm. Because when casting goes out, one of the things I, I, I mentioned to my students and to other people is many times what they're looking for is authenticity. Yep. Overall, they want an authentic storyteller for that purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what your skin color is, um, sometimes you can't tell that story. Hmm. Right. And I look at, um, like I had an, a discussion with someone who had had this whole thing, had kind of thrown a fit about casting that went out that was looking for a biracial person or was, no, was looking for a Japanese American woman. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I can't believe that they do this. This is so ridiculous. How will you know? I said, they don't know. That's not what they're asking. Mm. They're asking for someone who can tell this story authentically. Mm -hmm. And if the character they're representing is a Japanese American woman, it is probably more authentically told by a Japanese American woman. You guys saw over the years what happened with um, uh, Bojack Horseman, with um, with uh, um, the other um, Apu, the character in Simpsons, Simpsons mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. As we, as people said, you know, what you're doing is caricature, or it is relatively inappropriate. As far as Bojack Horseman goes, it seemed weird to have Alison Brie playing a Vietnamese woman. Mm. Um, those things are happening less. You'll see that now in a lot of castings that are going out and when they're doing animation and that, they're actually looking for artists who match that thing. And again, people will say, well, why? I said, authenticity. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Authenticity. Mm -hmm. Doesn't well, and the, and the brand, the product the brand, brand wants to match their branding with mm -hmm. the voice that matches their branding, right? Yes. So, yeah. But that so voice that's... has got to be authentic and tell yeah, the story authentic. in an authentic, yeah. beautiful way, right? Mm -hmm. I love, uh, I love this um, discussion. Positron is the technology busy voice talent need. It literally cut our editing time in half. Positron overlays your script to your voiceover to ensure script accuracy. In moments, you'll discover pickups or a perfect read. Upload your script, upload your audio, and Positron does the rest. For audiobook proofing, this is a must. For e-learning and long-form narration, even one page of script, this process couldn't be easier. Positron ensures your narration is word perfect, so you can focus on your performance and delivery. Check out Positron.com or email hello at Positron.com for a free product demo. VoiceActor.com is the fastest way to have your website up and running right now. Simple and fast. It's the do-it-yourself website builder for voice talent. No coding. And you can edit your own content. The plug-and-play website templates have everything a voice actor needs to insert demos, videos, testimonials, bios, and much more. It's a no-brainer. Websites work on any device. And you can use your own domain name. Go to voiceactor.com for more information. Voiceactor.com, powered by Voice Actor Websites. Well, thank you so much for enlightening us, George. Oh, um, so nice. It's it's a lot, and it can be a lot, and so many podcasts mm. are out there talking. But we appreciate. I think I can speak for Kim. Your insight, 
and your experience and your, you know, educating us even that little bit um, and hope to have you back for various things. So thank you so, so much. Well, thank you. And anytime I, I clearly can talk. Yay. <laughs> love it. Yay. And, and a coach, no less. Um, I love that you're available, not just as a voiceover coach, but it's almost like a cultural coach, like to, you give people permission to be who they are and, you know, of any, any race or sex or what have you. And it helps us be more authentic. Mm. I will, I will say that there are a lot of people and there's a, there's a, there's a strong belief out there that I, that people of color should not, we are not in a position to teach you anything. You've got to go learn. And what? Yes. That's a reality. People Can you say, say that again? Unwrap it for me, please. So instead of coming to someone like me and asking me questions, go figure it out because it shouldn't be on me to carry. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. And I understand that. I get that. Mm -hmm. But when my friends come to me to ask, I'm going to try to help them. Mm -hmm. Whether that's trying to help them through whatever situation they're in, or if they have a question that I can try and help give them some understanding, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're such a good friend and I'm grateful. George, I don't know if you've ever made it to the end of any of our shows, but we tend to curse and some people's Not faces. Not everyone does. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> Sometimes we shock people, but we say, fuck it. Let's be awesome. Now we've got shit to we've do. We've got shit to do. <laughs> we know you right? do too. Awesome. So thank you. Right? Cheers. Cheers. This episode of Speechless is brought to you by... Mm -hmm. 